Muammar Gaddafi, who gained power in Libya in a revolt in 1969 and whose Tripoli stronghold has been violently taken, was a dynamic leader. He was a bedouin tribal leader, colonel, and self-proclaimed revolutionary. He was Arab and African, nationalist and socialist, Muslim, poet, and would-be philosopher king. Following a civilian uprising against Muammar Gaddafi in Libya's capital on Saturday evening, Libyan rebels invaded Tripoli, gaining control of the dictator's last stronghold in a nearly bloodless assault on the capital. In his own words, he was the Libyan masses brother leader, supreme guide, mentor, patriarch, and uncle. Gaddafi, on the other hand, was a hubristic oil sheik, a fool, a braggart, and a ruthless butcher, according to his domestic opponents and much of the Western world. With his deposition as Libya's supreme leader, the international arena has lost one of its most colorful and unsettling figures. Gaddafi had the ability to astound and appall, to shock and amuse all at the same time. This Janus-like quality of looking both ways while holding contradictory opinions made him both a fool and a powerful foe. When visiting other capitals, he insisted on pitching a Bedouin tent, and his infamous entourage of heavily armed female bodyguards, ambitious projects, and absurdist finger-wagging homilies to world leaders made him a figure of ridicule. But the darker side of his character and leadership also made him an object of fear and hatred at various points during his 42-year reign. A vicious, duplicitous, and pitiless foe who would seemingly stop at nothing to maintain his dominance at home and advance his eccentric, bizarrely warped view of the world. Gaddafi's unstable personality was on full display during a meeting with a U.S. congressional delegation in Tripoli in 2009, according to the Washington Post citing WikiLeaks. At 11 p.m., the senators, led by Senator John McCain, were summoned to Gaddafi's sumptuous tent. Gaddafi looked to have been roused from a long nap, with rumpled hair and bulging eyes. Gaddafi's erratic side appeared to be in charge, dressed in crumpled jeans and a short sleeve blouse patterned with the continent of Africa. Gaddafi's other side, ruthless, bloodthirsty, and arrogant, was on display in a 2003 interview with the Washington Post. He was questioned regarding the 1988 terrorist explosion over Lockerbie of Pan Am Flight 103, which killed 270 people. By this time, a Libyan national, Abdel Basset al Megrahi, had been found guilty of the crime, and Libya had offered to pay $2.7 billion in compensation, leading many to believe that Gaddafi was personally involved in the plot. Gaddafi waved away the interviewer's queries, implying that it was time to put the whole thing behind him. When questioned, he flipped the script, arguing Libya should also be rewarded. Gaddafi was not always the obnoxious monster he became. Born in the desert outside Surrey, in 1942, to an uneducated Bedouin family, his viewpoint appears to have been formed during his school days by revolutionary movements in the Arab world, most notably in Nasser's Egypt and the 1948 Arab laws in Palestine. He became involved with a group of radicals at the Libyan Military Academy who were influenced by their studies of Greek democracy and Islamic egalitarianism. As a young, beautiful subordinate commander, he helped lead a coup against the pro-Western King Idris in September 1969, ushering Libya into a new era of ostensibly eternal revolution. He ejected Italian colonists, shuttered U.S. and British military posts, nationalized Libya's vital oil industry, and firmly positioned Libya in the anti-Western camp, advocating liberation fights in Africa, Central and South America, and the Middle East. He eventually declared the great socialist people's Libyan Arab Jamahiriya, literally the state of the masses, and established a network of revolutionary or people's committees in every town, hamlet, factory, and farm, which served as de facto enforcers of the new regime's diktat. Gaddafi removed conventional government structures, or rather, constructed a more vital, parallel power base that he, his relatives, and preferred tribal allies controlled, as outlined in the Green Book the primary literary companion to his so-called Green Revolution. He kept Islam and Islamists on a tight leash while professing his beliefs. Gaddafi did not accept a new legal title after resigning as Prime Minister in 1979, choosing phrases such as brother leader and supreme guy. In the meantime, all military ranks higher than colonel had been abolished. Despite all of his promises of leadership by the people, it soon became evident that there was only one colonel in Libya and only one voice among 7 million that actually mattered. Gaddafi was lucky in two ways throughout the 1970s. 
To begin, the big countries did not regard Libya as strategically, geographically, or militarily significant enough to be concerned by its wacky leader's views, at least at first. Second, Libya had oil prior to the war, and the government earned roughly $1.6 billion per year from exports, and Gaddafi used the riches and power it brought to keep prospective rivals at bay and the country under strict control. Libya's population, while small and compared to countries such as Egypt, had reasonably excellent living standards under his unusual guidance. Even Gaddafi's attractors acknowledged that his road, school, and hospital construction programs provided major benefits. Of course, much of the oil wealth, estimated to be worth $1 trillion over his first 40 years in power, was squandered, stolen, or embezzled. Gaddafi and his six sons, who became increasingly crucial props for his one-man government, amassed enormous wealth. The majority of non-oil industry and the agricultural sector wither as a result of neglect, lack of investment, and corruption. In terms of human rights and media freedoms, the Libyan people's state has become one of the most oppressive in the world. Despite its promising start at home, Gaddafi's revolution went off the rails almost as soon as he dabbled in global affairs. It was as if Libya wasn't big enough of a stage. His ego demanded that he be seen by a broader audience. He almost definitely obtained one over time. However, his open support for anti-Western terrorist organizations as part of his revolutionary ambition to alter the world earned him a slew of opponents. Libya's assistance, both direct and indirect, was indiscriminate and lavish. Terrorist organizations ranging from the IRA, the Red Brigades in Italy, and ETA in Spain to the Shining Path in Peru, and the Sword of Islam in the Philippines profited from his generosity. The capitals of Europe were bombed. Assassination squads were dispatched all over the world to assassinate Libyan dissidents, whom Gaddafi referred to as stray dogs. In the 1980s, Amnesty International documented 25 such killings. However, when Gaddafi focused his homicidal gaze directly on the U.S., ordering agents to bomb a cabaret in Berlin crowded with American servicemen, Washington and its allies drew the line. Following the assassination of WPC Yvonne Fletcher, Ronald Reagan sent flights of sea-launched cruise missiles slamming into Gaddafi's compound in Tripoli in 1986, characterizing Gaddafi as a mad dog of the Middle East and following aerial dogfights over the Gulf of Serti. It was a planned attempt to assassinate him, the U.S. later freely admitted, mimicking a similar alleged attempt by Britain's secret services. The Lockerbie horror appeared two years later, presumably in revenge. Sanctions from the U.N., the U.S., and the E.U. were increasingly severe, and international isolation deepened. Even fellow Arab leaders were put off by his attitude and interfering in their affairs. African countries took his money in order to curry favor and largely laughed behind his back. By the 1990s, Libya had become a pariah state with Gaddafi as its leader. Gaddafi's comeback was caked with his first address to the United Nations General Assembly in 2009. Predictably, Putin used his remarks to criticize the U.S. and other permanent Security Council members' dominance. But Gaddafi remained essentially the same man. There was no genuine change of heart only cynical political calculation for self-preservation. He claimed no responsibility for the terrors of the past, and his dark thread hung over his homeland oppressively. Even if ignorant Western politicians and business leaders were unable or unwilling to recognize it, the Libyan people did. As the brother leader aged, younger generations rose in quest of their rights. Rival sons fought for their unjust inheritance, tribal loyalty strained, and the Arab world exploded in turbulence. His fragility, harshness, and moral bankruptcy were clear to all. Libya's supreme guide has become disoriented. His 40-year-old mantra, God, Muammar, Libya, enough, had lost its clout. And in the end, he's being swept away as certainly and ruthlessly as an unwary airplane gliding through the Scottish skies. And with that being said, it's time to end our video. But before that, we would like to know what are your views on this? Let us know in the comments section down below. Like this video and make sure to subscribe to the channel for more amazing videos like this one. We will see you in the next video.